Let's, so let's read from Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 25. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual but I am unsp unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have a desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see other, another law, at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Well, good morning everybody. As usual, I'm struggling with the tech. Well, first of all, I want to thank Cam so much for the way she read. I remember when I was at school, which is a long time ago, someone stood up and read that passage and they fumbled away because it's a classically difficult one. So thank you, Cam, so much for reading it so well. Now, look, what we're looking at today is an unusual and difficult subject. And you must have heard, if you were listening, if you weren't drinking tea or whatever, um, it's all about the law. So I'd like you to quickly say, what law is it talking about? There's lots of laws in the world. What law is it talking about? Now, listen carefully. This law is the law of God. And the thing about the law is that it was given by special revelation of God to Moses on Mount Sinai. Therefore, it is very important. There are lots of parts of the law, the ceremonies, the sacrifices, even the dietary laws and the cleansing laws, etc., etc. But the heart of it all is what we call the Ten Commandments, the moral law. And it can be divided into two. You've got the laws relating to loving God, the first four, such as you're not bow down to any idols. You, there's only one God. You're not to have any gods before me and not to take the Lord's name in vain, etc. And then you've got the last six which are all to do with loving our neighbor. So it's about not deceiving people, not telling lies, not committing sexual sin, etc., etc. So these commandments, what is their importance? This is what we're looking at today. What is their importance for everybody? And what is the importance for you and I if we're Christians? We're looking at those two things. If you read anything in the New Testament written by Paul, he often writes mentioning the law. And often he says negative things about the law. So I want you to notice in verse seven, the very first question he asks is this, what shall we say then, is the law sin? 
And the answer is certainly not. Very, very important indeed. So that's what we're looking at today. First of all, God's law and everybody, whether they're Christians or not, whatever religion they are or none, God's law for everybody. And I'm, I've made a little title here, How God's Law Can Bring Us to God. How God's law can bring us to God. Now, if you look here, now, I, I want you please to be looking at your Bible more closely this week than is perhaps normal. If you look carefully at these first verses, 7 to 13, you will notice that the word I comes quite a lot. And you'll notice it's written in the present tense. Sorry, in the past tense. I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. In, in the past tense, once I was alive, apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. It's written in the past tense. This is Paul giving his testimony. Just a moment ago, we were privileged to listen to Pranita giving her own testimony, her own story. And Paul gives his story here of how he came to faith in Christ. Now, first of all, Paul thought of himself as a really good person. In fact, way above average because he was a religious Pharisee. That means he studied the Torah, he studied the law. Secondly, he thought that God's law was the way of salvation. If you wanted to come to God, if you wanted to go to heaven, you came through the law. And so he was very proud of the fact that he kept God's law all his life. And he felt superior to other people. He looked down on other people because he kept God's law. Okay, now I wanna stop here and apply this. There are many, many, many people around the world of all religions and even of none, who are not sure if there's a God, who try and live good lives. And you are among them. Because many people think the way to heaven is the Ten Commandments. They think, if I keep the Ten Commandments, then I'll be saved. I'll be fine. God will accept me. When I, when I pass through the veil and I die and I stand before God, I'll be okay. I tried to do my best. I tried to love my neighbor. I gave food to the food bank. One dear old lady felt certain that she'd go to heaven. Why? Because she fed the birds. You know, all sorts of people have got different ideas, haven't they? I'm a good person. Most people think they're good people. And they, many people think the way to heaven is by keeping the Ten Commandments. And it is a serious mistake. That's what comes out here. Look at Paul's experience. Paul actually was led to God partly through the Ten Commandments. Now we'll look at in a moment at how he met with God in an extraordinary way. We, many of us know the story on the Damascus Road and so on. But notice here, he said, I would not have known what coveting really was if a law had not said, do not covet. He's quoting one of the commandments. It's the last one, number 10. He's quoting, do not covet. Then it goes into details about your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's car. Well, he didn't say car in the old covenant because it didn't exist, did they? But it, you know what I mean. The equivalent there would be a chariot or something like that, you know. Um, it's very interesting because God's law, instead of being a vehicle that takes you to heaven, is a mirror that actually exposes all sorts of ugly truth about you and I. That is the picture we have of, the, of God's law. It's a mirror. When Paul looked into God's mirror, what he saw shook him. He saw hatred, jealousy, lust, revenge, greed. He saw all sorts of things because you see, the interesting thing is this. The last commandment doesn't deal with what we do or say. It deals with motives. It deals with what the Bible calls the heart. 
And that's the fundamental thing that's wrong with all people, including nice people like you. In our heart, we desire all sorts of things which are totally wrong, and we know it. But it takes God's mirror to show it up for many of us. Now, I want to, I'm just going to read verse 8 and 9 again, because this is a dramatic expression of Paul's experience of looking to God's mirror and what happened. This is what he said. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Now, that is dramatic language, isn't it? What an experience the Apostle Paul had. The proud, confident I died. And Paul saw sin not as things that you do, and especially what other people do, but he saw sin as a power inside of himself and inside of everybody. Now, do you see sin like that? It isn't just what we do. It's an ugly power inside us which will ruin us and of course in extreme cases we get addicted to all sorts of things secretly because there's a power within us greater than ourselves now a couple of weeks ago quite by accident i was with a friend of mine uh who'd been a criminal who'd been in prison and uh he came to christ actually in prison and he was speaking to a guy that knew him years ago who was a total skeptic didn't believe in god at all and i listened to his testimony and i was fascinated and this is what he said he said you know he said i got to a stage where my conscience troubled me notice that his conscience troubled him and he said i, I thought if there really is a god then I am in trouble. There really is a God, I'm in trouble. And that set my friend on a road that led him quite dramatically in his case to Jesus, because he realized he was in desperate need. So I wanna summarize this first part. The first part of my talk is how God's law can bring us to God. Summary, most people think they are quite good. And if they're religious, they may even think that they're better than most. God has to shake us out of this superficial mentality to realize there's something of our real state before God. Often he uses his law or one particular part of it to shake us so that we begin to ask how we can be forgiven and how we can be changed and cleansed. This will lead us to Jesus and what he did on the cross for each person. I want to ask very simply, has something like this happened to you? Have you looked into God's mirror and seen some pretty ugly things about yourself that have led you to the cross and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, I'm a sinner. If you have, that is Christianity. That is health. That is the way to God. Now I want to look at the second part, which is very interesting indeed, and it's from verse 14 to 25. And actually, I do thank Cam for reading it so well. <clears throat> it's very difficult because it's a heart cry. It's, it's a man in turmoil. It's a heart-rending cry of inner turmoil. And I'll just read two verses to you. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Do you identify with that at all? All of us must, to some degree. Now this is written for believers. This is written for those who are Christians. This inner turmoil, listen to this one here. Verse 21, I find this law at work. When I want to do good, 
evil is right there with me. You identify with that? You know, a lot has been written by many Christians over the centuries on this very passage of scripture. And there's been, actually, I must say, there's been disagreement. Some people say, well, this is the language of a mature Christian. Others say, ah, no, it can't be. This is a person who's not yet a Christian. And others say, actually, it's kind of halfway. It's a half Christian. It's very interesting. Now, I want to say, I, I want to give three reasons I think I've got down here why I think this is, in fact, a real believer speaking. But I believe such turmoil, such inner angst, to use that term, is very often the experience of a person early on in their Christian walk, but it can come back many, many, many times all through our Christian lives. The first thing is notice the present tense. It's no longer the past tense. Paul says, I do not understand what I do. He's talking using the present tense, his present experience as he writes that. And then he says something very interesting. He says, I delight in God's law, and I say it's spiritual, it's good, it's holy. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, etc. Uh, it says, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. I believe this. Surely, Paul must be describing his incredibly intense experience after the amazing time when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. Do you know he went there, um, a special journey from Jerusalem to Damascus, quite a long journey, 150 miles, something like that. Um, and he went there deliberately to wipe out the church. He was going to imprison and torture and even kill people. He, was a, he says in his testimony elsewhere, I was a violent man. He was like the IS of today. Islamic State people, so-called, who are religious and very violent. Paul was in that category. And suddenly, on the road, we've heard the story, there's this incredible light, brighter than the sun, and he's blinded. And a voice comes, Saul, Saul, that's his name before he becomes a Christian. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Very interesting words. Now, afterwards, after that, Paul went through an earthquake experience on the inside that transformed him. Now, we can't pursue that much longer, but I, I'm thinking of myself, my experience and i met up with a friend this week actually and i said to him i said by the way i'm speaking on this on sunday what was your experience now my experience and my friend's experience uh, are similar but we're from completely different backgrounds i come from a devout christian background i like um, pranita i was taken to sunday school and i still think of the songs i learned by the way when i was a kid of six seven eight nine very very important because we remember those all our lives um, but I was, I only really came to the Lord at uni when I was nearly 19. And I, I was a good boy. I was a nice boy. But after I came to Christ, that's when the Holy Spirit shone a light into dark places in my heart. And I came under deep conviction of sin. And that is, of course, what this passage is about. This is about deep conviction of sin. And that happened to me early on in my Christian life in a very intense way, actually. I, I couldn't believe what was in my heart. Oh, it's strange, isn't it? It's because of God's mirror showing me up, God's light shining into my heart. And I spoke to my friend, and my friend was an atheist. Didn't come from a Christian background at all. Um, he got converted later in life when he was 28, actually through a very serious illness. And he was in hospital and the guy next to him in the hospital bed was a Christian and told him he needed to receive Christ into his life. 
And it set my friend thinking and thinking and pondering. And eventually, back at his home, he cried out to God and said, Oh God, if you're real, come into my life now. And the Lord heard his cry and transformed him. And the lights went on. But after that is when my friend came under a deep sense of sinfulness. He thought he was a decent guy, a really nice bloke. But when the Holy Spirit shone into his life, then he came under conviction of sin. So I want to summarize and close now with these words. This experience is real for all Christians. If you're a Christian, you must know something of conviction of sin. And very often it's those closest to Christ who have the strongest sense of their own sinfulness. What does this do for a Christian? Look at verse 24 and 25. Listen to this at the end of this chapter. What a wretched man I am, says Paul. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What this does for a Christian, it leads us to a person. Not a set of rules, but a person. So the center of your Christian life and mine is not a set of rules, it's a person. In fact, it's the only person who's ever lived who's perfectly kept God's law, who's loved God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loved his neighbor as himself to the point of dying on the cross for his enemies. That person loves you. That person gave his life for you. That person is praying for you. That person is waiting ultimately to receive you into glory. That person looks on your life and wants your life to mean something in your generation. That is the center of the Christian life. And by the way, as you follow Jesus, you will automatically almost keep those commandments of God. Your focus is a person, but you will not be telling lies. You will not be committing sexual sin etc. You will not be stealing as you follow Jesus. So let's close with a word of prayer and then I'll hand back to uh, Tim and Becky. Shall we just pray a short prayer? Oh gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation of your holiness, your perfection in the law of God, but we thank you that you're a God of great mercy and we thank you that the law provided a way of salvation through sacrifice. And we thank you for Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross. We thank you that with God there is forgiveness. With God there is cleansing. Thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Bless the word of God to everyone who hears it today. In Jesus' name, amen.